Thank you very much indeed. Um, I thought you would have had enough of me, the number of times that I have spoken here. But uh, it is a privilege for me uh, to come here and speak with however many. I'm happy to speak to two people who are awake than to 2,000 people who are asleep. Um, before I go on, I would like to tell you how I got involved and when. Uh, Sri Lanka, then Ceylon, had just shed its colonial oppressors, the British. And I, like many other Sri Lankans or Ceylonese at that time, looked forward to a country where we could run our own things and do better than the colonial British. This was 1948. I was a 16-year-old kid. I'm telling you that because it's people of your age who should get involved. Once you get to about 30, you lost the plot. And once you get to 40, you're finished, you're gone. I was 16. I was in a Christian mission school, behaving in a completely unacceptable manner because I sent a note to 550 people in the school saying the plantation Tamils, these are the people brought by the British to work on the tea plantations in 1833. A million of them, they are the people who pluck the tea for the British capitalists to survive. They were treated like dogs, but they were the people who put the country on the map. And the very first legislation that the Sri Lankan or Ceylonese government passed was an outrageous act to disenfranchise and decitizenize a million plantation Tamils, one seventh of the population. Just a stroke of the pen and a million people became not only non-citizens, but non-people. And the members of parliament that they had elected were removed from parliament because they were not representing anybody with a vote. And I thought that, really, this was the wrong thing to do. So I sent a note. You didn't have all these iPads and this pad and that pad. It was written. Handwritten, 550 I circulated and said, come and protest. And I think mo most of you who have organized meetings will know that when you send 500 uh, invitations, you'll be lucky if five turn up. That's normal. And five did turn up, six with me. And they said, what do we do? Do we go home? I said, we came to protest. And protest we did. We walked around the quadrangle right opposite the church. Christian Mission School, and were booed. Ha! Future politicians trying to rule Ceylon. I said, no, we are not future politicians. But what was wrong was wrong. And we are protesting about that. A week later, my mother's brother, I come from a very capitalist family. And I'm a socialist and a left-winger because I have seen what capitalism has done to a country. My mother's brother was the leader of the Marxist party. And he organized a meeting without telling me. And he asked me whether I would like to come for a meeting. I said, what sort of meeting is it? He said, oh, just a meeting. And he put me in the car. I was in shorts and shirt with my school satchel. He gave the most fiery speech to 2,000 people on what was done was wrong. And I could have shot the guy when he suddenly turned to me and said, ladies and gentlemen, I've got a surprise for you. My young nephew here has something to tell you. I had no warning, no nothing. And I, I, I didn't walk up the 10 steps. I was pushed up. He said, this is your chance. Take it now. Or you lost it. I'm telling you all this because I think you should take it now or you lose it. I think I spoke for about 20 minutes. God only knows what I said. But all I know is that the whole lot rose up and uh, they applauded. I don't think they even heard what I said. And we had to actually ask them to sit down. And 
that was my start and I've gone from there an unending struggle often abused I was deported from uh, Singapore last December for trying to address this very same problem of refugees uh, a lot more but I'm not going to tell you because that's this is not the place to air one's problems I've titled this it is not a crime to seek asylum Australia's illegal and immoral treatment of refugees and asylum seekers. Asylum seeker bargaining. Both major political parties, Labour in power and Liberal trying to get in, are trying to outdo each other in adopting a tough policy they call border protection, or the country is being swamped by refugees. In alarmist terms, with no foundation whatsoever to win the support of the voters. You think you've got two parties, Liberal National on one side and Labour on the other side. I totally disagree. In the 38 years that I have been an Australian, I think you've got one party. Liberal and National and Labour are all the same. They've got different names. But they are the identical party. So changing one for the other is not going to help at all. Really, you've got only two parties here. Three, a tiny fledgling party. There's the one I belong to, the Socialist uh, Alliance. We've got Labour, Liberal and National on one side, and the Greens on the other side. And of course us, at the extreme left. That's all. So the vote for Mr. Rudd or Mr. Abbott, you're voting for the same person. Who is an asylum seeker or refugee? You know, Australia can't make up its own mind as to who refugees and asylum seekers are. Once you have signed the refugee convention, the convention defines it for you. And you don't want that uh, explanation or definition, then quit the refugee convention. That's it. Give three months notice in writing and quit. Article 1, Section A of the Refugee Convention, and I'll read it. A refugee is someone who has a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership, or a particular social group, or political opinion, is outside the country of his nationality, and is unable or owing to such fear, is unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country. Well, that is a refugee whether you like it or not. The High Commissioner for Refugees sets it out in clear, simple English. Refugees are forced to leave their countries because they have been persecuted or have a well-founded fear of persecution. Refugees run away. They do not know where they will end up. Refugees rarely have the chance to make plans for their departure, such as packing their belongings, saying farewell to loved ones, etc. Many refugees have experienced severe trauma, including torture. It is very important to remember all this. We'll come to it from the medical angle. Uh, as a doctor of medicine, I'm speaking partly for my medical concerns. An asylum seeker, again defined as a person who has left his country of origin and has applied for recognition as a refugee, in another country and is awaiting a decision on the application. Now, this is from the Refugee Convention. Now, Rudd nor Abbott nor that dreadful woman, Julie Bishop or whatever, they can't decide who a refugee and asylum seeker is. It's already done. One way or the other, whether they are refugees or asylum seekers or both, they are people fleeing dreadful, murderous regimes. As such, their rights, according to the Refugee Convention, have to be protected. <coughs> Asylum seekers are illegal immigrants, so they claim they are not. On UN Refugee Convention and Australian law, to seek asylum is perfectly legal in almost every country that I know of, at least the civilized ones. More than 85% of both people fulfill refugee criteria more on appeal. Even the UN High Commissioner for Refugees states that refugees can languish in camps indefinitely 
even if they are certified as refugees, according to UN uh, Refugee Convention. My question is, then what is the purpose of being certified a uh, human rights refugee who is certified as a refugee? What is the purpose of being certified if it makes no difference? And the answer is none. We talk of genuine refu asylum seekers. You know, the UN Convention does not distinguish with, between genuine and non-genuine asylum seekers. If they seek asylum and have grounds for doing so, they are asylum seekers. It is as simple as that. They are queue jumpers. There is no queue when people are fleeing murderous regime, nor should there be. I told you, I think said it before last, from the medical point of view, there is a queue to have your appendix removed. That is your waiting list. But if someone bursts his appendix, you put him straight up to the top of the list and operate on him straight away before he dies. Now, is he a queue jumper? And what would you do if you are at the bottom of the, uh, the pile and you bust your appendix? Would you wait till you got to the bottom there? You'll be dead. We must crack down on people smugglers. People smugglers exist because there is a need for people to flee barbaric regimes. I'm not supporting people smuggling, but I say that without people smugglers, most of those people who have come here would have died at the hands of a murderous regime that is currently running Sri Lanka, which is worse than that of the previous president who was my cousin. I mean, she was bad enough. She carpet bombed Jaffna in the north with half a million people. Even Boutros, Boutros Ghali, the Secretary General, said that he had concerns about the humanitarian aspects of what she was doing. And she was succeeded by this barbarian whom we got at the moment. And when I, I use the term barbarian, I really do mean a barbarian. Because he and his brother, who is a bigger barbarian, supervised the killing of 40,000 plus human beings in just the first five months of 2009. And now they have got a military police state that tortures people on return. And that is the country to which we are sending back. And last year, we sent back 900 Tamil asylum seekers. I mean, this is just outrageous. Australia is a generous taker of refugees. Nonsense. Oh, no, it's one of the most non-generous of asylum seekers. Takers. The number of refugees taken in relation to the population and the wealth of the country, Australia is a disgrace. Let me give you the actual figures. Australia, with a gross domestic product, GDP, of 35,600, the 13th richest country in the world, takes one refugee for 1,600 people. Tanzania, at the bottom of the pile, with a GDP of just $1,200, 144 from the top takes one refugee for every 40 people. Refugees cost us greatly. That is utter nonsense. It is border protection and bribing poor countries like Nauru and PNG that costs us a huge amount of money. Do you know how much this new policy of Manus Island is going to cost us? They won't reveal it, but I gather it's going to be over a billion dollars of your money and mine. A humane policy will cost us far less to say nothing of the loss of talent, expertise, and willingness to work that refugees often bring. I did a survey. Um, uh, being a Sinhalese, I don't speak Tamil, and the refugees have got, to, have got to go through an interpreter. As soon as they hear that I am the cousin of the previous president, bang, bingo. The conversation stops straight away because they don't know whom to trust. I did a survey of who are these people who are being locked up. I think it was then in Indonesia. I mean, there were carpenters, electricians, fisher folk, and farm laborers, people that this country needs. For heaven's sake, I was trying to get an electrician to do some urgent wiring in my house. I've been waiting three weeks. And where are the electricians? Locked up. To let refugees in will open floodgates and we'll be swamped by refugees. That is utter nonsense. 
Let me give you an example. East Timor is one of the poorest countries in this whole area. There is no flood of East Timorese into Australia. Why not? Because people would prefer to live in their homes, even poor homes, than come to a foreign country. Now that is a fact. It is not an opinion to be debated, but a fact to be faced. There may be terrorists, Tamil Tiger terrorists, among the asylum seekers. That is nonsense. If you were a Tamil Tiger and you have dropped your weapon, there is an international clause which says Hordi Combat, H O R S D C O M B A T, which says out of combat. And they deserve a greater protection than those who have never picked up a weapon. To do otherwise is a violation of international law. Asylum seekers are the problem. I would say that asylum seekers are not the problem, but the problem is the countries who force people to get into leaking tin boats and sink halfway from uh, uh, Indonesia and Malaysia to Australia. That is the government's Pacific uh, Indian Ocean solution to the refugee problem, to take them to the bottom of the ocean. <coughs> and our joker, who is going to come in September, hopefully not, Tony Abbott, not that there's much of a difference. He says he'll turn the boats back. Here, yeah, leaking boats have come, and this joker is going to send them back. What do you think will happen? There's no food, no fear, and the boat is unseaworthy. They will sink, for sure. The government claims that this is border protection and we are protecting the country. You cannot disguise racism and political opportunism behind the mask of national security and border protection. And it is our duty to pull down the mask and expose them in all its brutishness, ugliness and inhumanity for all Australians and the world to see. You see, Australia is a fantastic country. Some of the nicest people in the world are in this country. I've been here 40 years. I've met thousands of them because as a doctor of medicine, I see about 200 a week. They are great. But they are also the most uninformed people I have met. Given their education, they haven't a clue of what is going on. And it is our business to educate them. Australia is a Christian country. Don't make me laugh. It is a very unlike, unchristlike Christian who dis disregards the when I was homeless you took me in provision when those in need of a home have a brown skin. That is racism. There's one rule that lies at the heart of every religion that we do unto others as we would have them do unto us. If this is grasped and implemented, the world we share will be a better place for all of us to live in. Let me deal with some specific problems which are, which, or? Oh, good, thanks. I thought you said three minutes and I will get into a panic. Mandatory detention. Actually, I can stop any time. Mandatory detention. This is the only country in the world that has mandatory detention. Did you know that? Well, you should. Taking the legal process, you see, when you say mandatory detention, what you mean is that an asylum seeker comes before the law, say, the judge, he has no option but to send him to detention. Whether he is a genuine refugee or not or what, there is, there are, there, there is no uh, legal ability to do otherwise. That is what mandatory detention is. There is also not a scrap of evidence that mandatory detention achieved anything other than traumatizing an already traumatized people. It is inhuman, cruel, degrading, in addition to being a violation of the Refugee Convention. All it does is to damage Australia's reputation as a civilized country. There is no evidence whatsoever that mandatory detention of asylum seekers stops them from coming uh, uh, to this country or anywhere else any more than capital punishment prevented people from committing crimes that could result in execution. To, it is naive to believe that it does. The UN Refugee Convention. The Convention and, and its protocol are the 
principal international instruments established for the protection of asylum seekers and refugees, and their basic character has been widely recognized internationally. It lays down the basic minimum standards for the treatment of refugees. Human rights is a word that has been bandied around uh, for a long time. It refers to the rights and freedoms which function as standards for how people should be treated by their governments and by others. Underpinning all, everything in human rights, is the notion of the inherent dignity of all human beings, regardless of their race, sex, age, ability, and other attributes. Now, Australia, by signing these and many other, uh, which I will read out to you, has certain obligations. Under these agreements, the Australian government is obliged to, to avoid taking any action which may breach human rights. It also is obliged to take positive steps to ensure that human rights of people are upheld and are protected against breaches of human rights by other people and organizations. These include developing policy and drafting laws. So what goes on in the Department of Immigration in, in uh, Canberra is actually a crime. It's a violation of the UN Convention. You know, Australia signed a huge number, I think it's about eight uh, declarations and uh, international conventions. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is said to be the greatest document ever drawn up by any human being ever. That's signed by Australia, one of the first signatories. The UN Convention, Refugee Convention, which I have just told you about, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, ICCPR, International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, the International Convention on the Elimination of uh, the All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Now, I saw one yesterday, a Tamil asylum seeker, whose leg had been broken, plated, and the army, the navy uh, commander had kicked him, and the plate got bent, and I got the x-ray, if you don't believe me, it's somewhere at the back there because I'm taking it up with the UN. Australia's own regulations, Say, you know, it's not for lack of regulations. We've got bucket loads of regulations, except we all ignore them. The a Australian Human Rights Commission, set up in 1986, was established by the federal government to be an independent monitor to assess whether Australia is meeting its international human rights obligations. It is not. For decades, the commission made numerous submissions that mandatory detention under the Migration Act of 1958 be abolished because it is illegal. April 2010, Australia launched the Australian Human Rights Framework to see that public servants uh, got the message that there are certain rights that are, cannot be violated. Then in 2012, January, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights was set up to examine bills and laws that went through Parliament. Despite that, the dreadful migration law went through and more will follow as we got to uh, get legislation to get people to Manus and Nauru. How many minutes? Thanks. Australian Human Rights Complaint uh, Commission has an outstanding head. It has had a number of outstanding heads. The 2011-12 Commission received 290 complaints alleging breach of human rights by the federal government in the area of human rights. The majority were people from immigration detention centers. In the 19, uh, 2012 report concerning an inquiry into complaints by Sri Lankan refugees with adverse security assessments, the commission made a number of recommendations, including that the government pursue alternative closed detention, such as community detention, and bridging visas. What happened? Nothing. Let me get back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This key 
to all human rights legislation. Article 14, subsection 1, everyone has the right to enjoy, seek and enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution. That is the universal declaration of human rights. What about the UN Refugee Convention? It defines, as I just said, who a refugee is and who an asylum seeker is and sets out the basic rights that countries should guarantee to refugees. What are the numbers involved? I can give you the numbers right up to the 31st of May 2013. There are 8,521 people in immigration detention centers, including 1,731 children. That is a violation of the rights of the child. And 2,820 in community detention, including 1,326 children. Where are these people? 5,750 are in mainland Australia and 2,771 in Christmas Island. Where is the data from? From the Department of Immigration, of course. How long have these people been in detention? 7,247 have been in detention for not to three months, and then it goes on. Three to six, six to 12, 12 to 18, 18 to two years, and 112 for more than two years. You know, you keep people locked up for two years, a doctor of medicine, I'll tell you, they would drive them mad. Where are they? Well, I'm not going to read out the list. There are stacks of them, Villawood, Maribyrnon, Curtin, Yonga Hill, Perth, um, Darwin, etc. Then there's transit accommodation, or so-called. They are closed detention, intended for people departing Australia. That was the original intention. But now it is being used as yet another detention center. Adelaide in Brisbane, right here, Pinkamba and Melbourne, Broadmeadows. Alternative places of detention. These are basically jails, prisons, and uh, hospitals, and psychiatric uh, places. Then low security detention. Phosphate Hill, concentration camp uh, in Christmas Island, and so on and so forth. It goes on and on and on. Community detention is interesting. These are specified places in the community. Conditions apply. They have to report to the DIAC regularly and sleep at a particular res residence every night in the same place. They can't even decide where the hell they are going to sleep. The situation gets even crazier. Those in community detention cannot work. Full stop. Those who came after 13th August 12, 2012. Why 13th August? God only knows. And they get a bridging visa, they still can't work. Those who came before 14th August, who have a bridging visa, they can work. Can they go to church? Yes, they can. Provided they come with circle guards. How do I know this? Because I had to examine a refugee. I couldn't get into the refugee center, and he was a Hindu. Two or three of them. I said, look, become a Christian just for one day and come to church. And I took him behind the altar and examined the guy. And one fellow was at the point of suicide, mind you. What about the education of children in detention? In immigration detention centers, the answer is no. Presumably, the government wants to, to make them and to keep them illiterate. In community detention, yes, they can work. They can go to school, but not to child care. Child care is for decent children, and these are not. Third country pro processing, which is what we are here about. I love this word, processing. In my language, you process food, uh, not human beings. It was introduced in 2012, and asylum seekers who arrive by boats in Australia must, M-U-S-T, must, be transferred to a third world country as soon as possible. Since August 2012, hundreds of asylum seekers have been transferred to Nauru and Manus, uh, Manus Island. The situation gets worse. On the 13th of August 2012, consequent to a report of the expert panel on asylum seekers, the Australian government introduced third country processing for asylum seekers who arrive in Australia in excised offshore places like Christmas Island, by boat. If they fly, 
there no problem. When they come by boat, they're different. The Australian Parliament passed the Amendments to the Migration Act and designated Nauru and PNG as regional processing countries. It gets worse. Why? Because as was said, elections are coming. As elections come, the worst in politicians comes out. It happens over and over again. In May 13, 2013, the third country processing was extended to apply to asylum seekers who arrive by boat anywhere in Australia, not in Christmas Island, anywhere in Australia. It's worse still. They are going to be there forever and never come to Australia. Worse still, their claims for protection are under the laws of that country, not Australia. Processing started in Nauru in March 2013 on Manus in late June, early July 2013. Wow, I made a bit of a mistake here. Because in September 12, yeah, Australia started transferring asylum seekers who arrived by Australia by boat to Nauru. In November 2013 to Manus Island. As of 27 May 2013, there were 732 people, including 30 children, who were transferred to Nauru and Manus and detained in regional processing centers. Oh my God, the problem here. Because they have now violated the UN uh, Protection of Children Convention. So they were all brought back. I don't know who the hell advises these people. On the 4th of July, all the children were brought back to Australia. Oh my God, that violated another principle. And that is the principle of the unity of the family, which is in the UN Convention. You can't split a family. So what the hell do we do? We can't win either way. We keep them there, we are breaking one convention, we bring them back, we break another convention. So the only answer I can give you is, well, quit the lot and become a third world country. The no advantage, the third country processing has been established by Australia to implement the principle of no advantage. That is, to get the message across that there is no advantage in getting into a boat. If you stayed where you were in one of these third world countries, then you get to Australia at the same time as if you came in a boat. And when they were asked, what is the waiting period? He said, five years plus. I have serious human rights uh, concerns about sending asylum seekers to th third world countries, which I simply don't have time. There's a legal dimension too. You can sign whatever convention you want, but unless it is incorporated in Australian law, Australia cannot be charged. What are my concerns? A heck of a lot, but I've got no time to go into that. What about the push factors? And these are push factors I can only speak of Sri Lanka because I, I've known it since 1948. Afghanistan, similar, but I don't know enough. Now, the push factor there is that it is a criminal police state, and that is the state from which these people are fleeing, and that is the state to which you are generously and a Christian-like manner sending them back. That is murder. I saw a patient yesterday I think I'll have to bring it to an end, but I have to tell you this. There's a asylum seeker, came to see me. He has been, he was picked up in the north west of uh, Sri Lanka in a place called Mana, whose uh, Catholic bishop I know very well. He was raped. He was told that if he didn't come to the Navy headquarters, his girlfriend would be raped, so he turned up. And he was raped 700 times. And bits of barbed wire were put into his anus. And he has ripped his, I saw the anus yesterday. I know of him. There is a pocket of pus outside the anus where the barbed wire probably went through. That guy going to die. I mean, his leg is like that because I told you the Navy major kicked him. The raping was done, one by a senior member of the Navy. 
how do I, how does he know it was a senior member? I asked him. He said, because when the other guys who came to rape this guy saw the boss, he said, sir, boss, and where is the head of the Navy who was instrumental in bombing all the asylum seekers who were trying to escape in 2009? Where do you think he is? Right there in Canberra. He is the Australian High Commissioner for Sri Lanka, the Admiral Tisara Samarasinghe. And what have we done about it? Damn all. Thank you very much indeed.